Welcome, welcome to Massey College. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers and I'm the principal of Massey College. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here for a great discussion and part of our ethics series. I want to acknowledge that Massey College is built on indigenous lands, the lands of the Yorunwanda, the Onoshone, and it is the treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We want to acknowledge duty of stewardship toward this land and the great privilege that we have to be here to continue this great discussion on ethics. I am indebted to Tom Axworthy, who's been kind of creating this series and supporting it and thinking it through. I think we've been uh, doing this now for the third year. It uh, actually, for me, it's important that as we develop the junior fellowship in uh, at Massey that we insist upon there being good leaders, ethical leaders, and that's the reason for this series. So without further ado, why don't I pass the mic so that we can start this great discussion on, bar, uh, on whether sports help creating ethical leaders. Thank you. Welcome, my name is Don Gibson and Tom and I have been working on these uh, uh, panel discussions over the last few years and when we were talking about topics in the uh, the hot topic of course was Hockey Canada uh, and so we were kind of kicking that around and we thought perhaps what we should do is have a conversation on sports and ethics and in particular to focus on character uh, but I'm sure that Hockey Canada will likely uh, uh, surface at some point in this conversation uh, it, the whole intersection of sports and ethics uh, uh, perhaps we don't always pause to think about but the Hockey Canada thing certainly brought up front uh, we had a recent uh, uh, situation just this last week uh, where Philadelphia Flyers uh, uh, in their warm-up uh, uh, for hockey. The uh, players came out in the warm-up and uh, skated around with brightly colored sticks and jerseys and they were uh, to be used uh, uh, as a fundraiser for uh, diversity in sports. Uh, and uh, one of the Flyers players, young player, uh, chose not to participate because of uh, his religious uh, preference. And so again, these are all kinds of incredible intersections uh, that we, I'm not sure where we'll get in all of them, but uh, we certainly have a wealth of possibilities. I want to first introduce uh, our panel. And we have right beside me, Bruce Kidd, who has been an Olympic athlete. He's in the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame. He's Professor Emeritus here at U of T in Kinesiology and Phys Ed. He's also the Ombudsperson at this university. And Lashante Henry, next, is a junior fellow here at Massey uh, and uh, a law student at U of T. She attended Laurentian University, did a, an honors BCom and an MBA, uh, as well as ca the captain of the women's varsity basketball team and done a lot of uh, interesting work in human rights. And then we have John Phelan uh, at our end, who's been an athlete and a coach, uh, rugby player with Team Canada, coached in the Ottawa Senators farm system, has consulted with a number of NHL hockey teams. From 2002 to 2008, uh, he was the psychologist with the Canadian men's uh, hockey team. Uh, and at Queen's, he has taught and coached, uh, coaching rugby and hockey. Interesting quote as we begin uh, talking about sports from Einstein. Uh, Einstein uh, said, weakness of attitude becomes weakness of character. <laughs> Good character, if you were to get out your dictionary, is defined as an individual who acts and thinks and feels in a way that matches common accepted values. Honesty, respect, responsibility, caring, and fairness. When I was a kid, I lived in Peterborough and played hockey and baseball. In those days, the uh, sports were run by the local churches and, and not by the community. And so, of course, we had to go to Sunday school uh, if we wanted to play baseball or hockey. Maybe that was what their idea of building character, I'm not sure. Uh, but I, I was thinking about those days of playing sports and uh, looking for kind of an example at a, at a kind of a basic level to kind of kick off our conversation. I had a friend who was a reasonable player, uh, but his father would give him in 1962 25 cents for every single goal he scored. You don't have to take long to imagine that the kid scored goals, uh, but absolutely uh, no assists, uh, because it was all about getting that quarter. 
uh, and of course, it, uh, did it contribute to his character? I I'm not so sure. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, with Bruce, uh, and uh, as we delve into this question of, of ethics and, and, and character. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Don, and hello, everybody. Uh, this is a very timely question. In light of the many allegations of maltreatment and abuse that have been made by athletes in almost every sport mm -hmm. in Canada and across the globe recently. But the answer has never been clear cut. In a soon to be released survey of more than 1,000 Canadian gymnasts conducted by the respected McLaren Sports Solutions into uh, the most uh, well known crisis of Canadian sport, abuse in gymnastics. While 20% of respondents reported various forms of maltreatment, fully 80% reported they had rewarding experiences that gave them valuable training for life. In a, in a comprehensive lit review, Peter Donnelly and I coordinated for the International Working Group on Sport for Development in 2007, we concluded with respect to the psychological, social, and community benefits of sport identified in the research literature, evident benefits appear to be an indirect outcome of the context and social interaction rather than a direct outcome of participating in sport. In other words, it depends upon the circumstances. <laughs> On the positive side, the literature sh showed that sport may and in some cases has demonstrably contributed to economic development and employment, healthy personal growth and development, self-esteem and social responsibility, social inclusion in schools, community and post-conflict societies, especially for indigenous persons, persons with disabilities and LGBTIQ++. It also contributes to school retention, academic achievement, and school safety. It further showed that youth sport can decrease the likelihood of destructive and unsafe practices, including youth crime, drug use, and unsafe sex, reach young people who are not attracted by other networks, especially those hard to reach, build intergenerational networks, and give girls and women opportunities to challenge traditional and oppressive generations. As a result of our study and the recommendations of the International Working Group, the United Nations has linked sport development to the Millennium Development Goals and most recently the Sustainable Development Goals. And there's a huge effort at the policy level to explicitly connect investments by governments across the globe in sport because of their potential to contribute to the realization of the SDGs. But there are lots of buts. In Canada, there are huge accessibility and equity issues. Despite the Olympic movement's widely communicated claim that the performances of exceptional athletes inspire others to participate, even when we are winning more medals in international competition, as been doing regularly over the last 30 years, Canadian participation is falling like a stone. So the graphs show that the medal count goes up and at the same time the participation rates as measured by StatsCan goes down. The determination should not surprise anyone. As inequality grows, public programs are immiserated, pay for play governs opportunities, only the well-to-do well can afford sports for themselves and their children. And we were talking about hockey, and I've been in several of these conversations recently. Um, it's become a middle-class sport, and the best athletes now come out of the upper middle class, whose parents can support uh, all of the special programs to enable them to get to the top. My colleague Bruno at Simon Fraser University, not so long ago, uh, wrote a paper entitled, Gordy Howe would never make it to the NHL <laughs> today. <laughs> the best player of our generation. Mm -hmm. Because his parents and his circumstances would never enable him mm -hmm. to succeed in hockey. 
A second caveat is that sport is a necessary but not sufficient condition. To, to get the benefits we promise, participants must fail safe, valued, socially connected, and morally and economically supported. There needs to be a supportive social context. It can't just be about those 25 cents a goal. That's right. The skills and enthusiasm of trained, committed administrators, coaches, and volunteers is key. If you only had one fear to invest in, it would be caring, knowledgeable coaches and leaders. To be successful in building character, sports programs should be part of a multi-agency uh, approach and link in an explicit or um, or, 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 or organic way to education, uh, health, and uh, as athletes advance employment. Uh, it can't just be sport for sport's sake. And programs must be sustained to have a lasting impact. They can't be a summer uh, one-off. Uh, in the last 15 years, increasingly, Canadian athletes have added another factor. Athletes must be involved in decision-making. In both the current legislation, the Physical Activity and Sport Act of 2003, and the Canadian Sport Policy, the Federal Provincial Territorial Agreement to coordinate the support of sports, enhancing participation and uh, assisting excellence have the same rhetorical weight. But in reality, most of the money and the attention goes to performance. We need to make this a much more visible public discussion, and so I'm delighted that Massey is having this. During the last two elections, there was not a single word uh, from any of the parties about sports policy. Thank you, Don. Thank you. I think for me, one thing that I really would pick up on that Bruce said was, I found surprising was the difference between the increase in goals and the decrease in participation. And I really thought about that. And I think part of that is because winning is contagious. And the more you win, the more you want to. And in doing that, you kind of forget the importance of participation and supporting and developing the, the talent or even just allowing other people who maybe aren't as skillful but could still benefit from participating. In Those people are sort of forgotten because they're not gonna help us win. So I think it's really important when we're thinking about sport, what goals are we trying to get out of it? Is it to win or is it to build character and more ethical leaders? And I think once we shift that focus, then you can see a change in some of those statistics. Okay, thank you. John. Okay, yeah, I concur with everybody here. I totally see a value in society. Um, the question I always ask is, is, and I've been a coach, I started coaching when I was 16 and I'm continuing to help coach now and assistant coach at a high school rugby team in Eastern Ontario, but I believe it can make character. But I'd also like to put an S there. I think it can also make characters. And sometimes <laughs> characters can be really bad <laughs> because they have a lot of power. And uh, that's something that we have to really think about sometimes. I just think looking back and, and this really, really uh, resonated with me is that I basically set up my professional career trying to answer this question, having played at a high level in rugby and then coached at the professional level in ice hockey. I kept coming back to this, where does character fit in, where does ethics fit in? And then you throw in the combination of money and it becomes just this really, can be a really positive snowball effect. Good way, but I said it can also be in a really negative way where it takes certain people completely out of their character and puts them in, they manipulate and they do real damage to not only themselves, but their colleagues. So I, I see sport as very important and that, that's sort of my history. And <clears throat> I guess I look back to one of my last games I was uh, playing just fun, fun rugby and I was on the pitch and I heard a, a racial slur. And I went to the individual and I just said, if you ever have to say that again, I'm gonna beat and which I shouldn't have done. And I'd forgotten that my mom, who was a formal five foot one, and had supported me in everything, a single woman back in the 50s and 60s, 
uh, and had really taught me about life, come stomping on the field with my stepson, who was about, and then I learned about my stepson. At Lorna, John swore, and my mother walked right under the pitch and then again grabbed me by the ear <laughs> and said, if you ever do that again, you will, <laughs> I'll never come and watch you. <laughs> so that was a very eye-opening uh, situation for me that really brought it back. And it brought back another memory with uh, my mother and, and, you know, coming home and, you know, you lose a game or something. And I, she, awesome thing. says, life isn't fair, get over it. And I think that has taken me through everything. You know, we want it to be fair and we try and legislate it, but you can't legislate fairness. You have to feel it and grow with you. So that, that was mm -hmm. one of the uh, mm -hmm. interesting things. And looking back, I think what I realized, how big an influence good coaches had on me about how to behave. Because as an athlete, in that point in time, I'm sure you agree, it seems like the only thing that matters in your life, because it probably is. But the sun comes up the next day. And I think that we have to really, really understand that, that you can always take lessons from it, but we've got to keep the big picture in mind. Am I helping these young athletes as a coach become better people? And if I'm not doing that, I'm not sure what I'm coaching for, quite honestly, even at the, the professional level. And I coached in the American Hockey League for a couple of years mm. and had friends with the players about that, about being good people. And I think, to me, that's ultimately best spot. And I, I just like to say that when I look back at what the influence I said, good coaches, I still remember the name of all the good coaches I had. It's funny, I can't remember the names of the poor coaches. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that's a way of maybe blocking out things. But good coaches had a huge influence on me. And to answer your question, just to sum it up, as I've gone back to school at two different occasions trying to find out this answer, taking sports psychology and then going on to look, look at and doing my highest level at possible in coaching ice hockey, which I coached for many, many years trying to figure out how this uh, just position works. So I'm still searching. <laughs> okay. I, um, many years of living in Montreal, I attended a downtown service club and I got to know Red Story really, really well. Yeah, you, <laughs> we're talking about characters. Uh, Red was one of uh, uh, Canada's great sports characters. Uh, in fact, as we sit here, just down the road here at Varsity Stadium, uh, he scored three touchdowns in the fourth quarter of a great cup game. Tom beating Winnipeg, by the way. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, which is still a record. He was a referee, a broadcaster, just a larger than life character. And he and I were playing golf one day, it's a number of years ago. And my kids were young, and I was in our local community coaching T ball. And I was saying to Reg, you know, I said, like, I can't believe what I had to do yesterday. I had to go to the recreation director of the community and insist that one of the fathers be banned from coming to little to t-ball game because he was just such a jerk. I mean, scrawling not only his own kid but all the other kids. It was just your stereotypical nightmare. And Red said to me, he said, you know, I've often thought if we really want to develop athletes. We, we need to treat it like school and dance class uh, and piano lessons where the kids go, they get let off by the parents, uh, and they get invited occasionally to a concert, uh, and, uh, uh, but they're not there all the time. And, you know, that's Red's little twist on it. But it raises for me, we're really talking about here the development of individuals and their character, but we're also talking about the whole question of serving the common good. Uh, and I'd l I'm wondering just a little bit of reaction on what we're doing or what we might need to do more at that basic level of developing young athletes. What, the, what do we need? Could we do better? Uh, what are we doing well? well uh, so we'll, we'll stay in the same order. So I'll just throw that first at you, Bruce. Uh, well, I think we need to create more opportunities in public institutions particularly the school and the community center, so that people do have accessible opportunities and, and do, uh, do outreach to bring in uh, those who are not already there. So uh, those who feel intimidated or fearful uh, because of the, you know, the cultural views of traditional uh, swimming pools and community centers are actually uh, met and encouraged to come in. 
uh, there's such a culture of whiteness around swimming in Canadian mm -hmm. society that uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of people, even from cultures with strong swimming traditions, feel that it's not for them. So number one is to make our public opportunities available and provide uh, and deliberately reach out to include those who are, are, are not there. I think secondly we need to, uh, changing cultures uh, take time. I think we, we need um, in the public sector, in the educational sector, to make it clear that our goals are uh, the, the character creating in the good way uh, that, uh, that we want of us. Uh, that, that those uh, are, are our expectations and uh, provide clear directives to teachers and coaches and then do monitoring and evaluation, which, which we have the means to do now. I mean, we monitor and evaluate everything. So, so let's ask coaches and teachers uh, about the things that, uh, that are in terms of character building. Uh, do athletes stay in school? Are they able to apply themselves well to, to their schools? Are they respectful, uh, you know, for, for, you know, to to others? And 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 I think we need to build th that in. At at the highest level, the financial incentives uh, need to be adjusted uh, at at Sport Canada, for example, in in terms of the public expectation board. I mean, the, 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 the horror right now is that uh, if, if, if coaches don't produce winning athletes in the national sports system, and if sports uh, governing bodies don't produce medals, then their public funds are cut with a very, uh, you know, very short timeline. Uh, so that the, the coaches and athletes, that they're training and they're, they're racing for the future of their sport, not just themselves. And coaches feel entitled to use abusive methods uh, to, uh, to push athletes because they know that their jobs are on the line. That has got to change. There are some, some, some fairly humanistic goals set out in the, in, in the federal act. The incentive should be tied to the realization of those. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, you obviously had a good, good sports career, uh, and uh, I'm wondering if you might re share with us, as you were growing up, some of the best practices that you saw in terms of that development, and perhaps areas where some improvement might be needed. Sure. I think for me, the thing that I would say, or best practices, was having support, and I think that I didn't get that fully until actually playing at the university level. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I had coaches there who really believed in me and invested in me, and that's when I really began to shine. And then on the flip side of that, earlier when I was playing, I didn't receive that, and that kind of impacted my development, and in some cases, my enjoyment of the sport. Um, I started playing just in school in grade four. I never played in a rep team until I was in grade 11, I believe. Mm. And at that time, the coaches told me that I was old. I, I should have started sooner, <laughs> pretty much. That's scary. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it, it, they said it was too late for me to start. Um, and at that point in grade 11, maybe it is, but my younger sister, it, when she was in grade four, decided that she wanted to play basketball. And at that point, she was also told that she was too old and she should have started younger. <laughs> so <laughs> I think one thing that I was saying needs to be changed is kind of the cut At grade four, I think you barely know what you're interested in, let alone yeah. <laughs> to be cut off from starting a sport or learning to play. So I think that giving support to people who maybe don't know from the time that they're four years old that they're interested in the sport <laughs> mm. and giving them the opportunity to learn about it and to grow would be really beneficial and can al also help to cultivate talent that would otherwise yeah. go unrecognized. Mm. I'm just gonna, you were gonna, yeah, you, you wanna respond, well, go jump in please. You know, there's both an age just, justice and an athletic uh, answer to the very bad practice that you experienced. The research increasingly shows that the best athletes are those who at those years, grade four, played many, played many sports and didn't specialize early. 
So mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry about your <laughs> yeah. I was just going to ask as a follow-up to that. Mm -hmm. um, if you didn't have that support, what what was missing? I mean, was it was it structural in terms of not having coaching in, at the at the younger level, or do you have a, a feel for what was missing? Like, I think it was something as simple as I believe that you can do this. I think, okay. especially at that young age, mm. that goes a long way. Yeah. <laughs> having someone yeah. think that you can have potential or you right. deserve a spot on our team, I think that would make a huge difference. Okay. Okay, John. Yeah, I just uh, really agree with what has been said so far. And I also think that we can identify sport a little differently as sport as um, wellness and, and being healthy. Play the game, not about when, but being out in the outdoors, kicking the ball around or shooting the puck around or, or shooting net, whatever. But I think sometimes it has to be sport and see it as going somewhere. Why isn't it just exercise that makes you feel better? Mm -hmm. It's a part of our wellness, of the way we want to live and have a healthy life. And, in the, and in, by doing that, we're going to cut down health costs anyways. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talk about uh, physical conditioning being an issue. Well, it all has to do with uh, wellness and sport and a bigger picture of sport. And I think that as, as, as directors being involved in sport, you have to recognize that sport of ice hockey, one more for those, like 99% of those kids are not playing hockey professionally. So what about that 99%? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do we offer them? Can they be better sports? Can they say, you know, mom, mom, mom again was the greatest teacher, says, everybody can't win. Did you have fun? You know, I remember when we finally did win, she, you know, so what did she held a party, we had hot dogs, you know, and that was the, the, the big deal. But that was once in the 10 years I've been involved in sport. The rest of it was enjoyment. And it came from, first and foremost, it came from coaching. If we had coaches that quit, we had coaches that came up and accepted us. And I remember one year, probably amazing years, that our coach says, you know what, guys? I think we can win a game this year. Mm -hmm. We win the last game of the year, you know? <laughs> but did we ever learn about life, about supporting each other, even when you lost? We didn't play an indoor game. It was all on outdoor ice at that time. But we, we became great friends and we supported each other. And those are lessons I've taken throughout my whole life. The championships come and go. But the lessons you learn by being a good teammate mm -hmm. are change your life. Okay. I want to switch gears a little bit. Uh, and um, this summer, one day, my youngest son was visiting. And I was sitting watching the Blue Jays. Uh, and uh, he's not particularly a fan. And, uh, but he sat with me to be polite, and we chatted a little bit back and forth. And partway through the game, he leans over to me, and he says, Dad, he says, it's time to interrupt this show on gambling uh, and show a little baseball. And he had not seen this, you see, this whole shift uh, and the connection. And, and maybe this is my old Methodist heritage here, uh, but uh, the whole shift of, of sports and online gambling. And, and I mentioned earlier that young Philadelphia hockey player and the whole issue of sports and athletes as kind of a role model uh, in terms of our, of our wider community. And, and I'd be really interested to hear comments on, on what you feel. I mean, is it unrealistic to expect that these professional athletes should be role models? I mean, are we off track on that? Maybe we shouldn't expect that, to, uh, but comments. So Bruce, thought of Well, I know some of the most famous American athletes now say that they're not role models, Charles Barkley in particular. Mm. Uh, but I don't think it's unfair to expect them to behave ethically because they draw considerable income from endorsements in which it's their character as well as their athleticism that's being marketed. So I think it's fair to hold them up to the same kind of expectations that we hold up public figures uh, and, and, and artists uh, and, 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 other, and other people. Um, I am horrified, sickened by the ads on sports television. I feel like I'm watching a casino and I'm horrified <laughs> yeah. that so many prominent athletes now uh, endorse these ads and that uh, the leading corporations uh, have become uh, partners to the gambling industry. I know we're not going to, we, we can't uh, roll back the clock and ban the sports betting industry, 
but surely we can stop uh, the ads on television, and surely we can uh, insist mm. upon a firewall between people who are actively playing the sport and act actively pushing uh, for the games. Um, I, I mean, there's such a potential f for manipulation and conflict mm. of interest there, it's, mm -hmm. um, it, it's frightening. And finally, I'm upset by the, 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 the grooming and it's the grooming it, of, of young people to think that sport is only about gambling. Uh, there's mm. so much, I mean, I recently published an op uh, stating these points, I think, a bit more succinctly. Uh, one of the things that led me to do that was um, a Hanukkah dinner with one of my, uh, with family and a nephew who is, um, a child and youth psychologist at a public hospital uh, in the GTA. And he deals with, uh, with young people with, uh, w with uh, mental health issues. And the what are the two biggest issues he deals with? Eating disorders and gambling disorders. Mm. You know, and, and, and his stories, you know, were just so, so soul destroying. Uh, it's a public health issue as well as an issue about the moral of sport, that we uh, at least uh, legislate or rate these ads on television. Other jurisdictions are now doing that, and I think we should too. Thank you. Latante? Well, this expectation around sports and its public image. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a bit torn on this question, to be honest, and I think that's because on the surface, I don't think that it's fair to have the expectation of athletes. I think at the end of the day, they're humans and they will make mistakes and it's unfair to put them on a higher level than you would of anyone else. But at the same time, I think the way that we see and regard athletes in our society mm -hmm. means that we often look up to them. They're always visible within society. And so because of that and the impact that they can have, maybe we should have them <laughs> Uh, more accountable and expect them to be more ethical and and so that's why I'm a bit torn on the on the subject mm -hmm. I'm I'm not sure where, yeah. where I land. I'm, I'm just I'm sort of reminiscing uh, when I was very young I mentioned earlier we lived in Peterborough and different era we live in now uh, when I was like eight nine years old I'd get on my bicycle in early September and go down to the hotel leave my bike against the wall and go into the hotel lobby. I mean, we would not do that with our eight, nine-year-old kids anymore and collect autographs. Toronto Maple Leafs would have their fall training camp there. Mm -hmm. and, and I look back, even though I've long ago become a Montreal Canadiens fan, uh, I look back on that, those moments of encountering those athletes and getting their autograph and just, you know, how deep a connection that was for me as a youngster mm -hmm. uh, and so it you know it speaks about that idolization and so yeah. John any, any yeah I'm I'm pretty strict on this I think that if you're a paid athlete those expectations have to go with that and if you don't want to do that then don't be a paid athlete mm -hmm. and having mm -hmm. coached professionally in a small community so no excuses here those kids look up to you yeah. like you if you don't want to do this then quit go go to something else but as long as you're a paid professional athlete and you're in that community, there's some standards that go in, but because that goes with the territory. You, mm -hmm. you know young adults, you know that they get their autograph and put it up on their wall and say, I want to be just like him. Well, then respect that and, and say, okay, let's lead the proper way. So I'm really strict on that uh, in terms of professional athletes. You take the money, you've got a role to play. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a number of people here. Anybody would like to ask a question? Yeah. Is there, a, is there a microphone or are we, please? yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I'm Noah, I'm a junior fellow here, and I guess uh, to preface what I'm about to ask, uh, before graduate school I was a professional video game player, so I flew around North America on a team uh, playing eSports. And so I was wondering, uh, my question concerns the, the role of technology and the future of sports, uh, and whether you think that the ethical considerations you've made today uh, connect with sports, or, or does that is that a different terrain with different uh, ethical considerations? 
Um, because I've seen that obviously technology has driven a uh, kind of lower participation in traditional sports, but uh, esports is, is this kind of giant booming industry right now. Um, so I just wanted to, to ask your, your opinion on, on that uh, domain. I'm a, you know, talk about technology and sports uh, and, and we have conversations at home. I get frustrated with the umpires balls and strikes calls in baseball. And there's a part of me that would love to see it done uh, with mm -hmm. technology. Uh, you know, uh, do you remove the human element and increase the technology? Uh, but I, I'm not there yet. But uh, any, anybody want to jump in? Because it's a, it's, yeah. No, I'd invite you. I mean, yeah. I'm not part of the eSport world. I would like to think that the ethical uh, considerations that we've shared here and that are part of the culture of sport for a very long time would be accepted uh, and, and, uh, and enforced in the eSport world. I know that the eSport community would like to be in the Olympics. Uh, I would think that one expectation, one condition of that uh, would be that uh, the same values that are expressed uh, in the Olympics uh, would be expected in the eSport world. But you're a participant, why don't you tell us? Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, my own experience in, in eSports was uh, one that felt, like it felt as though I was gaining the kind of traditional benefits of sports. There was a camaraderie between me and my teammates. There was, there were ups and downs. There was, uh, but the, the one thing that I do think was different was that there was a uh, to, to the actual game itself. So, for instance, I think that for ins with basketball, it's hard to be addicted to basketball in the sense that, you know, you have, you have to go to the court and you have to... I, where, are you, where have you spent your life? I, not addicted no, to basketball. I, 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 understand, I, I understand that you can be addicted to basketball, but I think that the degree to which you can be addicted to a video game is much higher than a traditional sport. Because with a traditional sport, you have to go out, you know, you know, find a pickup game uh, or, or play you know, in your driveway or, or what have you, whether uh, notwithstanding. Whereas with a game, like it's just, it, it's, it's, you have it at all times. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are other considerations like uh, you know, technology culture. So for instance, the idea that if everybody else at your school is, is playing or online, you feel like you need to be online too. Mm -hmm. There's a, a kind of pull into the spaces that uh, I think there are a lot of different uh, ways in which tech, technology and esports uh, differs uh, and changes the conversation, but I don't want to, you know, divert okay. uh, too the, far. Um, so. Quite apart from the, the technology, which is quite intriguing, uh, and it has it's having a huge impact on, on sports and increasingly, is you, you you talk about the participation. And, and John, you talked a little bit uh, mm -hmm. about that inclusion, uh, yeah. and so I, I'm, you know, others can jump in too. But I'm just looking at you because you touched on that whole what you've just described, which is that that involvement, that engagement. Yeah, I think that, uh, and I, I think inclusion is really important. And to answer your question a little more specifically, is that as an athlete, a physical athlete, I, I kind of look at the body and as a table, and there's four legs: there's mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual. And so you're doing the mental, you're doing the emotional, certainly spiritual, but the physical part, then you have to bounce off. If you're doing, that's all you're doing, you're not looking after yourself. As an e-athlete, eventually it catches up. Just as professional athletes are the customary athlete, if they're not doing the emotional, mental, and, and spiritual side of it, it catches up. So I think that, to me, any, any sort of high level uh, performance is, is it, the higher you get, the more it's about understanding what personal balance is, mm -hmm. so that you can be healthy and make the wise cho choices. Because it's really easy. The difference between addiction and liking, I don't have to tell anybody here, it's, it's pretty close, it's pretty fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking about being addicted to basketball. This is the gentleman who, when we did one of these sessions back in March, was at one of the co U.S. college uh, playoffs uh, down in Buffalo, and you spoke to us from, you know, way, way up on the top of the stadium in between at the halftime. <laughs> you were in this dark little cubby hole. It was quite intriguing. So, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I, I you know, the whole conversation about expectation uh, and what... Um, what we place on athletes. Uh, uh, many years ago when I was in Montreal, I used to uh, uh, go and do 
services for the Montreal Expos on a Sunday. Yeah. We'd do 20 minutes in, the, in, in their dressing room and 20 minutes in the visiting one. And at that point, Major League Baseball, interestingly enough, was the only sport that had in their collective agreement that, on, that there had to be worship time available to their athletes. I don't know if that's gone, but that was at the time. Wow. But my young son used to come with me, and he was a big baseball fan. And he got really close to one of the athletes. And, um, you know, this guy would bring him stickers and cards and always make a fuss and go get him ice cream. And this guy got busted for drugs. And for my seven or eight year old kid, that was just like his, just shattered, right? I mean, in terms of uh, how he felt about this hero that he put on a pedestal. Mm. And so I'd like to, a little bit more comment if you have on, you know, what do we do with this whole issue of pedals and athletes and fallen athletes? Well, I think we need to be supportive uh, uh, in a restorative way to those who fall uh, off the pedestal. Mm. I don't think we're going to change the expectations and I guess uh, at this point in my life having lived with expectations like this all my life I don't see uh, any reason to change that. Um, I see my friend uh, Jamie Laidlaw is there sitting with two copies of my recent memoir <laughs> uh, ab about my uh, 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 and, and you know I, I was None of you are old enough to remember, but I was a successful athlete in my youth. And, I, and as, a, as a teenager uh, in the East End of Toronto, a sport-loving uh, community, and then at the University of Toronto, where I came as a high school student to run with the University of, of, of Toronto uh, track team, um, I, I, I was qu very quickly bestowed with uh, the expectations that I wasn't running for myself, that I was running for my institution, and mm. I was running for my community, and I was running for Canada. And I, I struggled with that, and I described these struggles in my memoir. This is not a, but I came to believe that it was not a bad thing to be expected to act in concert with the, the values of, of Canadian sport and, and the university uh, where I, I was a student and, and a track and field athlete. Um, I think about that today in the light of the debate about gambling and sport. Uh, Canadian society has, has invested, and I would say privileged, sport at the highest level in a lot of ways. I mean, we, we enable professional sport uh, by enabling the cartels like the National Hockey League and the National uh, Basketball Association and so on to work here. We enable them through the tremendous publicity we've given Hockey Night in Canada and the Public Broadcasting Co Corporation. We, we have enabled uh, the Blue Jays and Major League Baseball with $400 million of subsidy uh, to the construction of that public stadium at a time when sports, f when financial support of amateur sport was being cut back. So, so um, I think that, I think it's, it's not unfair to me. You're in a business that has been granted enormous privileges because you're expected to act in mm -hmm. an ethical mm -hmm. and, 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 and a way that's consistent with our values. So get with the program. Uh, I realize that those expectations are hard and we do have to help those who, who find it difficult. Mm -hmm. But I don't think those are, are unfair. And the last thing I would say, since this is massy, is you know, the expectation that athletes are symbolic representatives of the communities that they, they live in is, is one of the oldest um, themes or narratives of, of Western civilization. Uh, going back to the Greeks and the Egyptians and, and uh, and, and you know, you know the scripture, you know, Christ used the message, you know, of, of the athlete uh, to uh, give an example of the best. So mm -hmm. it's very hard, if not impossible, for, for anyone to step outside those traditions yeah. quickly. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I have one, uh, Tom, actually. Um, on the, um, the question, which has been one of the themes here, about participation levels in sport. 
and how that has been going down. Um, in terms of support of public policy, we, we have that goal, and it's enshrined in legislation. And yet, on the other hand, around the Olympic Games, there's a massive campaign on own the podium, as if only by winning a medal is it worthwhile of, of, of uh, attention. And that goes against the whole idea yep. of the Olympic mm -hmm. Games. There's a tremendous discrepancy then in how we approach sports, but also how the public arena uh, supports uh, sports. From the days of participation, which was to have the widest possible, to own the podium. So what has to change? Uh, how can we get back to those ideals of participation as opposed to own the podium? I mean, cannot governments simply say, you're not going to lose your job if you don't win X, Y, and Z, but you'll be in trouble if we can't raise the participation levels around the country in this given area. What's gone wrong that we've got so much? Well, I would say that I would say two things quickly. You go ahead. Uh, one is you're, you're perfectly right. Own the podium changed the conversation yeah. and it changed the culture. Uh, Secondly, today, at least in the pan-Canadian sport community, the questions that you ask are being debated intensely uh, at the government level, uh, at the level of the sports bodies, in locker rooms where athletes, how do we get it back to what you're talking about? Uh, and what's unusual is that athletes in almost all of the sports that we've done well in, in the Olympics, have, have stood up and called upon their sports bodies and governments to make changes of this kind. John, yeah, yeah, I'd just like to concur with you, Bruce. I really believe that uh, it's getting the numbers out as usual. And, and, and being the bottom line, to me, has always been, if we're not developing better people, i.e. better citizens, what is the, why does any money go to it? Because, honestly, that's what it's about. But if we're not... Our role is not to be all players or professional basketball players. If they happen to be there, that's fine. But uh, the, the total base is about developing better people. And, and I think that it, it, it has to start also with organizations. You know, I'm, I'm familiar with hockey. It's, it's not an option to play everybody that you've got in your ice hockey team. They all pay the same amount of money. And yet you have teams that say, well, we're in general playing, but uh, one of your players didn't get on the ice for a period. Come in. It's called uh, participation, action. Get involved. You pay the same money as my friends, and yet I did, didn't get on the ice. And yet we have coaches coming along and saying, you know, when introducing sports, saying it's all about winning. It's not about winning. It never is. It's about participation in my good sport. Do I listen to people? Can I grow? Can I learn from failure? Can I learn how to handle success? Those are life lessons that we used to, I think, certainly I, I found out and sport more about that than anything I, about winning. And we were lucky to win, but we lost a lot. But boy, did I uh, learn a lot about life. Mm. Thank you. Know? you. Well, Sean, a question along this line. Um, in our society, you know, at every level, we, we raise a lot of money through uh, corporate sponsorship, charity, government, uh, tremendous money goes into sports. Uh, and. Uh, as one who's been an athlete, um, is the money going in the right places? You know, where, or, or if you could say, you know, boy, if we could take that money and put it at this level, where, 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 what do you think? I think that the money is not always going in the right places. <laughs> yeah. And I will explain on that a little bit. Um, one thing that we were talking about were the expectations that we have of athletes. And I think one of the reasons why I'm hesitant about having that expectation is we don't really train athletes on how to be ethical or what good character even means. But yet still we have this expectation that they need to exhi exhibit these characteristics. So I think one place could be in training and actually teaching athletes the broader life lessons that sports teach and making sure that they lessons and can apply those both within their sport and in the broader community. Okay, thank you. Any, yes. 
Well, we've got a, well you, and you have the microphone, so you, it's yours. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is um, Mr. Chuku. I'm an engineer fellow here. And um, I'm looking at the topic about um, sports helping to build character and um, looking beyond the sportsmen themselves to the followers of the sports. And, and my question, and I'm going to think about it in the light of his own question about participation or about making the podium. So you see some of the followers of this sport, the fans, not having um, good character you know, in terms of maybe um, racist abuse, um, hooliganism. You know, we, we see that a lot in football, which is soccer here, but in England it's football and all that. So do you think sports is doing to you know, curb some of those excesses and build the character of the fans? For me, I don't think so. If you agree with me, why? If you don't agree with me, why as well? So I would like to know your perspective. Thank you. Mr. Nanda, you kind of started down that road. Uh, uh, with a few, any, what, any quick response to that? Yeah, I would say I don't think that uh, sports organizations are doing enough in regards to the fans. And I think a part of that is a lot of money. And you don't want to do something that's going to stop that flow of money coming in. So again, I think it goes back to what are our metrics and what do we think is important? Is it about winning and money or is it about building good character and good individuals within society? And I think once we kind of figure out where we want to land on that issue, then maybe sports organizations will do better to curb that behavior, both athletes within the sport and fans. Okay, I, I, I agree with what you're saying for sure. And I think that one of the things we can't be afraid of is in our organizations, in our districts, we have to bring that up. We have to talk about developing better character and saying, this, if we have to win, fine, but are we developing better citizens here? And, it, and each organization, I think that's where the structure of the organization and the leadership there is important with the board of directors. You know, sitting down and talk about this. Are we developing professional athletes or developing better people? And why isn't it a combination of both? But we can't have one without the other, I think. And I, th I think organizations, and it's, it's really easy to measure success of the number of professional athletes as opposed to only how many great people did we develop. Mm -hmm. But I think that we really get stricken by the headlines and the media of, oh, this player came from this organization as opposed to look at how many great citizens we create who are making our community better, who are out coaching their kids and, and, and being involved in the community in a positive way. And I think that that to me is what sport is ultimately about and always has been and always will be. And if we happen to produce a few great athletes that win Olympic medals, well, that's not bad, but that's not what it should be about. Thank you. I think we had a question over here in the corner. You can't hear me, can you? But can you hear me? I can hear yeah. can you. Hear can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, because I can't hear myself. <laughs> <laughs> this is for the professor emeritus mostly, but is an artist of a psychologist as well. Uh, Bruce, you knew my father pretty well, and don't know if you knew that he took me to the uh, Maple Leaf Gardens indoor games as a quasi-religious experience to watch you <laughs> run <laughs> 50 years ago with uh, Bill Carruthers, who was the other person that we mm. followed. I don't know what happened to Bill. He was known as a pharmacist at the time, but no one followed his career. Maybe you'd elucidate us on that, but that's not the... The main point, uh, when, when I was growing up, we were in uh, essentially an authoritarian society. Uh, I went to Upper Canada College, and everyone was punished uh, in various ways, which Black, who everybody uh, at least knows the name of, objected to the way he was caned in the college. And I think he objected in a way that was, uh, he thought he was special, but no, he was caned the same way everyone else was caned. So for his revenge, he stole um, uh, the, the term uh, examination and sold it to the boys. Now, the only innovation there was sold it because actually Dr. Bassett's drawer was open and everybody could go and get the, the examination and look at it if they wanted to. So he had a sort of a you know, strong sense of uh, you know, just his own story there. But the, the story of, of that school was there was a, um, corporal punishment was normal. It was accepted. The parents accepted it. Uh, we had no recourse as children, however, no one to represent us. And the kicker was my father was a child psychologist at the, at the prep. 
So, you know, there's that. And then there's, of course, the gardens and the malfeasance that went on there with, I, I forget, was he a, you know, some kind of guy who groomed a whole bunch of kids who, you know, came out in the book called The Gardens of Shame. Now, my grandpa was a, uh, an original shareholder and uh, director of the gardens, and he was uh, himself not given to uh, pedophilia. Uh, he was uh, chair of the hospital for sick kids, and uh, uh, he also famously slept through the meeting where Harold Ballard reinstatement came up, and the vote was tied, and he was asleep. So he was woken up to vote. <laughs> and you could say he was making a decision, except that he didn't know what he was voting on. And unfortunately, he voted for a herald to be reinstated. So that's how things can roll out sometimes. But I'm, I'm really getting at the point that getting at these difficult situations where there are lots of people implicated in them mm, okay. is extraordinarily difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it's something we haven't, you know, we, we're, we're soon out of time, but we haven't really talked about the whole Use. But no. Bruce, do you, do you want do you have a quick response? Because we are. Oh, you don't have to. Then write me a letter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure what the specific question was, but I think that moments, uh, you know, getting at abuse uh, is a complex task, uh, multi institutional. But I think moments like this that shine light on them are, are, are positive. Uh, because they lead uh, people to uh, think about how we can do it better. Uh, they, they often lead to reforms, and they certainly lead to better intentions about calling out uh, the, you know, the abuse from whether it's just offhanded racist comments to, um, to uh, abusing uh, young athletes and so on. So I think we're in a we're in a we're in a series of crises, and I wouldn't say I'm hopeful, but I'm encouraged that these that that these uh, cases are coming to light, and hopefully there will be more public energy to do something about them. Lashanda, you you more than any of us have been more recently involved at a high level in athlete athletics, so. I'd be interested in just your quick comment on this whole issue of, of, of abuse and uh, you know the impact that has on on athletes even, you know what yeah. I think one of the issues and one of the reasons why it is prevalent and it can happen is because athletes don't really have a place to turn to there's a, a there's a huge between power between an athlete and a coach or another administrator and and without a system where athletes can go to to report that abuse and know that they will be heard and not ostracized for that, mm -hmm. I think creates an environment where that will continue to happen. So I think the first step would be creating an external review to so that or a place where athletes can go to report that, so that when they go there, there will not be repercussions for mm -hmm. going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. John, any? No, I just concur with that. I think you need an external organization have that come forward, yeah. no question. Okay. Yeah, all right. And one yeah. has been created. Yeah, I mean, one of the, you look at professional athletes and one of the huge challenges is that, you know, when they have uh, hearings, they're run by their leagues, uh, which are run by their owners, right? And it's, a, uh, it's not an independent uh, yeah. or sometimes very reasonable process. We're reaching the end of our time, uh, and we could just dig into all kinds of other things. But I want to thank all three of you uh, for sharing from your experiences. It's been uh, uh, intriguing and insightful and really very appreciative. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.